Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the second meeting of the committee for 2019. Can I ask everyone to ensure that mobile devices are switched to silent? Our first agenda item is Age of Criminal Responsibility Scotland <coughs> Bill. And can I welcome our first panel, Lord Advocate, Solicitor General and Anthony McGeehan, Head of Policy at the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal. Um, can I invite the Lord Advocate to make an opening statement of up to five minutes, please? Thank you, Convener. Um, since I was appointed Lord Advocate, I've spoken from time to time about the fundamental rights which underpin the investigation and prosecution of crime. So it's a particular pleasure for me to make my first appearance before your committee. All legal systems have to address the challenges which arise from harmful behaviour by children. In addressing those issues, the state needs to put in place and to maintain an effective system for investigating and prosecuting crime. That's a human rights requirement, an obligation under Articles 2, 3, 4 and 8 of the European Convention, whilst also fulfilling its obligations under the UNCRC. I welcome the balance which is struck in the bill that you have under consideration. It was the outcome of careful and detailed consideration and consultation over a long period, uh, including in particular the work of the advisory group on the age of criminal responsibility. And that work provides a solid foundation for raising the age of criminal responsibility to 12. Any decision on a further increase in the age of criminal responsibility will ultimately be a matter for Parliament. Uh, but I hope that I can provide some context by reference to the practice and experience of prosecutors in cases involving children aged between 12 and 15. It's perhaps worth reminding the com committee of the role of prosecutors in our current rather sophisticated youth justice system for cases involving children over the age of 12. Only the most serious cases involving children under 16 are reported to the Crown as well as to the reporter. For those cases which are reported to the Crown, prosecutors apply a presumption that the case should be dealt with by the reporter. And under those arrangements, the great majority of cases involving offending by children under 16 are dealt with by the reporter, either because they're never reported to the Crown or because the prosecutor refers the case uh, to the uh, reporter. But in those cases where the circumstances require it, a prosecution may be brought. And where there is a prosecution, uh, the courts are, are subject to special rules which apply both to the trial process and in relation to sentencing, which recognise the fact that the accused is a child. This is a system which enables professional judgment to be applied with a view to dealing with each individual case in the appropriate way. Uh, we have two options, the hearing system which is appropriate for most cases and for those cases which cannot be dealt with in the hearing system appropriately, prosecution within a criminal justice system which is modified to recognise that the accused is a child. And I should say both the Solicitor General and I, and for that matter uh, uh, Anthony McGeehan, have direct personal experience of considering cases where children have committed serious crimes, and I can certainly testify to the anxious consideration which is applied to such cases. Prosecutorial experience would support two propositions. First, that even in the 12 to 14 cohort, we see children who commit very serious offences, often but not exclusively against other children. And second, that the number of such cases increases with the age of the child. And that experience is supported by data from the Crown Office database. Uh, I should say this is an operational database, not one maintained for statistical purposes, but even subject to that caveat uh, provides uh, some useful uh, information. Since 2011-12, uh, 1,285 persons have been reported to the Crown who were aged 12 or 13 at the date of report. Of these, 1,139 were jointly reported and were ultimately dealt with by the reporter. Uh, 27 cases involving 29 accused. Uh, 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 th there were 27 cases in which criminal proceedings were commenced where one, one or more of the accused was 12 or 13 at the time of report. Six cases were prosecuted in the High Court and five before a sheriff and jury. I, I can give the committee more detail about these cases if, if that would be helpful, but they include a charge of murder which resulted in a conviction for culpable homicide and attempted murder serious assaults, willful fire raising and rape of younger children. In the same time period, almost 19,000 charges were reported to the Crown against individuals who were 14 or 15 at, 
the time of the report. The great majority were jointly reported and ultimately dealt with by the reporter, but almost 3,000 of the charges called in court. Within that cohort, my officials have looked more closely at cases where the accused was 14 or 15 at the date of report and was still 14 or 15 at the date of disposal. 47 such cases were dealt with at solemn level, high court or sheriff and jury, and of these, 26 resulted in a custodial sentence. The headline offences included serious assaults, robbery, willful fire raising, rape, attempted murder, and culpable homicide. The absolute numbers of solemn cases in these cohorts may be relatively small, but each one is a serious case, and in the context of the basic responsibility of the state to which I referred at the outset, our youth justice system needs to be able to deal appropriately and confidently with every one of these cases. That certainly does not mean that we should set our face against a further increase in the age of criminal responsibility, but it does suggest that before we could decide to remove the ability to bring a criminal prosecution in relation to such cases, we, we would need to address with some care how we would equip our system to deal with them appropriately, confidently and indeed fairly. Can I ask for some examples around the decision making um, process of taking a prosecution to an adult court with a younger person? Yes, I don't know whether the Solicitor General would like to. Um, yes, that in question. relation to a, a child um, under 16, um, there's, a, there's a number of sort of instruments that would be applied. First of all, the Lord Advocate's guidelines, which provide for the cases to be reported in the first place. But we would apply, first of all, the prosecution code, the general principles that govern our decisions to prosecute in the public interest, taking account the, a range of factors, including the gravity of the offence, the impact on the victim, uh, and so on. But I'm actually glad you asked this. We've just been discussing it before we came in, because in relation to young offenders, um, we increasingly are aware of the vital need to take into account the circumstances of the child, him or herself. And that is um, a product of a, a, a direction of travel, a journey that um, we've been on, which I referenced in my recent speech at the Colbrandon um, event at Edinburgh University, which uh, is to reduce the numbers of children um, brought in the, uh, prosecuted in the criminal courts. Um, we recognise that um, it's an adverse childhood experience. We recognise fully the, the, the consequences and implications for, for that child's future. So that, in addition to the circumstances of the offence, which may be grave and heinous and have really significant impact on victims, you can understand the conversations that we have uh, with victims and, and next of kin in these circumstances. But to take the right decision it is abundantly clear now that we require to understand more about the child's circumstances and background and to, from that, assess what the right disposal is to, to, to address those needs to prevent further offending as well as mark the, the, the criminality. So it's a, it's a complex decision-making process in relation to children. Um, we are very much... Um, wanting to reduce the numbers of ch children who are prosecuted under any circumstances. And that's what, why one of the first things I did on, as appointment, uh, on appointment as Solicitor General was with the Cabinet Secretary for Justice then to, to set up an expert advisory group to look particularly at reducing sexual offending by children against other children, which has been on the increase, significant increase in the last few years. So um, we have a sophisticated system. It is acutely aware of the obligations under um, various uh, international human rights instruments, the UNCRC uh, principally. So the, the answer to your question, how do we go about making these decisions, we take, out, take into account a range of factors, the prosecution code, but also the interests of the children. Thank you. I wonder if I yeah. had a couple of observations. Um, the, 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 one of the virtues of our system is that um, um, in, rather than having sharp cut-offs based on chronological age, um, in that um, p 
period um, in relation to those cases which can be jointly reported um, and in relation to those cases which are jointly reported, um, the uh, agreement between the Crown Office and SCRA and the guidelines that are, are, are the Lord Advocate um, lays down support, first of all, discussion between the prosecutor and the reporter and the exercise of professional judgment, looking at the whole circumstances of the case and of the child uh, concerned in order to reach the right decision in terms of the um, way in which that particular case and that child should be dealt with. Okay. Thank you. Fulton McGregor. Good morning, <coughs> Good morning uh, panel. <coughs> I think your opening uh, statements and um, opening answer to, to the convener has, has given a good overview of, of how a, how the system operates when a child's um, charged with a with a serious offence. I wonder if you could elaborate a wee bit there on what you were talking about when it when it is jointly reported. How do the conversations between yourself and the reporter operate, and who has the final say in that? Uh, uh, is it yourself or is it the reporter? Um, ultimately, it's the uh, and, and, and the starting point, of course, is we're dealing only with the cases which are jointly reported. And under the Lord Advocate's guidelines, um, it is only, as, as you'll appreciate, it's only um, the serious cases which are jointly reported. All other cases go simply go to the reporter. But in relation to those serious cases which are jointly reported, um, ultimately it is the prosecutor who makes the decision whether to retain the case for prosecution or to um, re release the case to the to, to the reporter, and that and that's um, that that's as it should be. It's ultimately um, um, the responsibility of the prosecutor to, to decide independently in the public interest whether a case should should or should not be prosecuted. Um, but under the Lord Advocate's um, uh, guidance and directions, first of all. Um, uh, prosecutors are enjoined to have discussions with the reporter about the appropriate um, course um, and um, to obtain information from the reporter which will be relevant to that <coughs> ultimate decision, information both about the circumstances of the child as far as known to the reporter but also about how the reporter and the hearing system um, m might um, uh, you know, the, the, uh, might approach the particular particular case. The ultimate decision uh, is for the prosecutor, but the prosecutor applies the presumptions set out in the d directions that the Lord Advocate lays down, that I lay down, um, which is a presumption for the case to go to the reporter uh, unless the public interest requires that it be prosecuted. I suspect Anthony is probably best placed to speak directly to the kind of dis discussion that would happen between a procurator fiscal and the reporter. So Anthony, I don't know if there's anything you would like to on a daily basis those con on a daily basis those conversations take place between prosecutors and reporters. And as the Lord Ad Advocate has said, that discussion takes place in a particular context and that context is a national agreement between COPFS and SCRA in relation to the way in which cases that are jointly reported will be dealt with. Um, so under that agreement, um, there is a presumption that children under the age of 16 jointly reported to SCRA and COPFS will be dealt with by the reporter. But that presumption can be rebutted or overcome, and there are a variety of factors specified that should be considered when deciding which organisation should take the individual accused. The factors specified are the gravity of the offence, <clears throat> whether there is a pattern of serious offending, whether there are services within the children's hearing system currently working with the child, whether there is likely to be an adverse effect on the victim if the child were to be prosecuted, any health or development issues that might indicate that the child's needs and behaviours would be better addressed within the children's hearing system, or whether a disqualification from driving is a likely disposal. Those considerations are in turn echoed within our published prosecution code, as indicated by the Solicitor General. So within the published prosecution code, the following factors are identified as relevant to that discussion, and these include the nature and gravity of the offence, the impact of the offence on the victim and other witnesses, the age, background and personal circumstances of the accused. In particular, the Code states that the youth of the accused may, depending on the other circumstances, 
be a factor which influences the prosecutor in favour of action other than prosecution, i.e. the matter being dealt with by the report to the children's panel. We also consider the effect of the prosecution on the, on, the, on the accused, and in particular the Code states that in some cases prosecution may have the potential to affect the accused in a way or to an extent which is wholly disproportionate to the gravity of the alleged offence. So these are the types of factors that we routinely fold into our conversations with reporters day in, day out, and lead us to a decision as to whether or not the case should be dealt with by the prosecutor or by the reporter, but remembering our starting position of it is only the most serious cases that will be reported jointly to SCRA and um, COPFS. Those less serious cases are reported to the reporter only. Yep. Could I pick, pick you up on that then? So I suppose it's come back to an earlier uh, stage of the process. The, uh, the Lord Advocate gave a, a, an overview of what, what would be considered serious offences, but when they're jointly reported, I'm assuming that's from the police jointly reported. So is there is quite strict guidelines on the police about what constitutes a serious offence? Yes, it is those offences um, that would... It, the, sorry, the Lord Advocate has published guidelines to Chief Constables regarding the reporting um, of cases to the Procurator Fiscal. And it's those offences that are... There are three categories of offences that are required to be jointly reported. The first is that offences that are required by law to be prosecuted in indictment or which are so serious as normally to give rise to solemn proceedings on the instruction of the Lord Advocate. Okay, okay thanks. That, that, that's really helpful. And I think you've, you've actually, um, between the answers and, as I say, the opening statement, you, you've covered a lot I would be looking at. It. One other area I wanted to ask about, though, was um, is there ever a circumstance where um, a, a child could be reported for uh, an offence which would be considered under the rules and guidelines not serious or not, not serious enough to be jointly reported. However, they've got past behaviours or an accumulation of um, previous <coughs> offences or charges. How would such a situation like that be dealt with? So for, so for example, to, to give an example, a child maybe um, is, is reported on an assault charge that perhaps wouldn't meet the criteria to be jointly reported. However, they had a serious assault charge previously, which was jointly reported. How would that be dealt with? Um, I think the if a serious assault charge had been dealt with by, by, for example, the reporter under that scenario, yeah. and we were dealing with a freestanding assault charge that would not merit solemn proceedings, and the child was, for example, 12 or 13, the presumption is that that case we dealt with by the reporter, and if we look at the the considerations that are specified, um, I would anticipate that that case would be continue to be dealt with by the reporter. Um, there were there were and are examples. You've given a very specific example <coughs> of a, of a former or a previous serious offence. Um, but the Inspector of Prosecution recently conducted a thematic report on the, on, the, on the prosecution of young persons, and that report identified situations where young persons were reported in error to COPFS by the police, the police perhaps having um, having identified the case as a serious case inappropriately. And in those cases, there were 11, 11 cases identified by the inspectorate, and in those cases, the prosecutor in all but one case referred the matter to the, to the reporter, so the prosecutor acts as a gatekeeper to the adult criminal justice system, discussed the matter with the reporter, and referred the, the cases to the reporter as appropriate. There was one case where proceedings were initiated, but, but thereafter discontinued by COPFS. And the... The, the inspector has recommended that we as a system guard against any inadvertent net widening, um, and that's a recommendation that we've accepted and we're taking forward with Police Scotland. That's very helpful. I think, I think the whole issue of um, repeat offending and escalation of offending is just the type of matter that will be discussed one-to-one uh, -one between the Procurator Fiscal mm. and the reporter, so that um, the reporter can give his or her view on progress that the child is making, under the very supervision requirements, um, whether there is they, they want to keep the child effectively to continue that good work, notwithstanding uh, further offending. There will be cases, however, 
and I think the Lord Advocates had per personal experience of, of one such case, albeit historical, where notwithstanding the work that the hearing system is doing with the child, nevertheless, offending is increasing, risk of harm to that person and to victims is increasing. And I think we have a responsibility in the public interest to have those close and detailed conversations. But where that risk is escalating to a point where the children's hearing system cannot adequately address that behaviour, then, then a, a judgment has to be made about whether, in fact, the time has come for um, a, 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 an adult criminal justice response. And, and there are cases, sadly, as the Lord Advocate referenced in his opening remarks, of, of, of serious and escalating and very worrying risky behaviour, which we need, we need to discuss and, to, and, and do the right thing by. Okay, that's very helpful. Thanks, Convener. Oliver Mandel. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Convener. I just wanted uh, just to be absolutely clear, uh, Lord Advocate, that you t to know that you still believe it's in the public interest to prosecute 12, 13, 14 and 15 year olds uh, for those serious offences uh, you, you and the other panellists have outlined. Um, under the system that we currently have, um, the cases that we prosecute um, where the children are of that age, um, it's my view it is in the public interest that we prosecute those cases within the system that we currently have. And that's why in my opening remarks, um, uh, 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 well, um, nothing in the information that we've given suggests that we should set our face against looking at increasing the age. Um, it, it, it does suggest that before we could decide to remove the, the remove the capacity to prosecute those cases, we need to um, address with some care how we equip our system as a whole to deal with each of those cases appropriately, um, confidently, <coughs> and I said fairly because one has to remember that um, uh, 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 always keep that in our mind as well. So, um, based on that answer, would your advice uh, to the committee and and Parliament being when we're looking at these new amendments that have come forward that propose moving to 14 or 16, that it's more important to do that work first uh, than, 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 than to, to blindly agree to those? Or uh, is, is, is that what you're saying? I, I would never suggest that Parliament would act blindly, but um, uh, it, 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 my view would be that the work needs to be done first. And we have to remember that the, the really substantial work done across uh, a number of agencies in order to equip ourselves to um, um, bring forward the bill that, that, that's before the committee, a bill which I support, and I support because of the work that's been done to give us the confidence that the system as a whole is equipped to accommodate and deal with the, um, the general principles that have been agreed in relation to, to this bill. It, it seems to me to be really important that we address the range of issues that will need to be considered um, before we make a decision uh, to uh, it, increase the, the age of criminal responsibility um, uh, 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 or indeed to remove the opportunity to prosecute the, 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 the kind of cases that I've, uh, I've referred to and that the Solicitor General and uh, 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 Anthony McGeath and have referred to. I th thank you for that. I, I guess I'll probably know the answer to this question before I ask it, but it's more uh, to put it on the record. Are you uh, fully confident that our current system uh, with the proposed uh, bill I would fully comply with all of our international obligations. Uh, I'm, I'm satisfied that it, it, uh, it, 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 it does so. Thank you. And then um, in, in, in that context, it would really just how you would respond uh, to the recent comments from the UN that have the, come the, highlighted to the committee and the government. Yes. Um, I, I mean, these, these are comments brought forward in the context of... Um, uh, a draft general comment which recommends, um, uh, and I think it's perhaps important to just look at the wording of it if I can find it, uh, that recommends um, that um, consideration be given to raising the, the age to uh, uh, 24. Um, uh, 
sorry, 14, sorry, it's, it's draft, draft, comment, uh, draft general comment 24, um, raising the age to 14. Um, um, uh, what, what, it, um, what, what the draft comment says is that um, states' parties are encouraged, encouraged to increase their minimum age to at least 14 years of age. Um, our international obligations are set out in the UNCRC itself. Um, um, the precise legal status of general comments is a matter of, of some debate. I, I certainly would uh, I encourage the, 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 the committee um, to take seriously and, and to regard uh, with uh, uh, and to take fully into account uh, anything said in a uh, in a general comment that has been approved. Um, the current general comment, of course, recommends. Uh, 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 12, but uh, I do know the draft general comment um, is a, a recommendation to, um, uh, or, or encouragement um, uh, to increase the minimum age to at least 14. It is really important, I think, to keep in mind that it is, uh, these are general comments which are not focused on any particular legal system. Um, it's ultimately the responsibility of this Parliament and the government to seek to ensure that we implement all our international obligations, including our obligations in relation to the effective investigation and prosecution of crime, and our obligations in res respect of the um, rights of, of, of victims, as well as respecting our rights, uh, uh, respecting our obligations under UNCRC. Um, uh, and it's precisely because, ultimately, it's for this Parliament um, to um, fulfil those obligations or secure the fulfilment of those obligations in our system with all its very particular features uh, that I would uh, support uh, the work that will be necessary in order to consider whether we can uh, raise the age to 14. It's, it, it's absolutely right that that work should be done, um, not least because of the encouragement given by uh, 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 the draft uh, general comment, assuming that it's adopted. It'll be right that that work is done, but it does seem to me correct that that work should be done and carefully considered in the light of the way our system operates and that we look carefully at what adjustments we might need to make in different parts of our system before we make we we, the people who are actually responsible for implementing human rights within our system, uh, as parliamentarians, as prosecutors, as a government, that, 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 that we do that work before we uh, make that decision. OK, I'm sure uh, other members might have further uh, questions to that, but I want to just ask one final question, convener, on something uh, slightly different. It was just around offence grounds, uh, where, where cases are being referred, um, and really around the, the burden of proof We've heard from a few uh, witnesses and a few submissions uh, that there is some, some concern about that, obviously with the difference, uh, particularly for more serious offences being considered on the balance of probabilities uh, as opposed to beyond uh, reasonable doubt. Um, is, is that something which would, would concern you um, in terms of things going uh, to, to the children's reporter, that there might be uh, young people uh, who, who are not necessarily picking up a criminal record but are potentially uh, being accused of quite serious offences who might not have the same legal protection? Well, it's inherent in, in removing the offence ground that the activity is no longer considered to be a crime, and that then has, has consequences in terms of... Um, or, 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 you know, which have to be, be thought through. So that's part of the context in which the bill contains provisions, as the committee uh, appreciates, um, to deal with the investigation of such behaviour, because it is no longer regarded as criminal, um, uh, it, it can't be investigated as a crime, and therefore the police have to have appropriate investigative powers um, to make sure that harmful behaviour can be uh, appropriately addressed. Um, um, it is a feature of our current system that um, uh, there's a, a burden standard of proof before a um, b b before a criminal offence can be um, uh, uh, established, um, and that, of course, is our protection for the accused. Well, you, so, so you think it's, it's it's perfectly comfortable for a young person, I mean, in effect, to to, to 
you know, as a matter of, of, of fact, it to be established that, for example, that they they killed someone, but that that could just that decision could just be taken, you know, by by an official, by you know, government, you know, or a, a government-approved process, you know, just on the balance of, of probabilities. Well, is that, do you, do you again, that again, that creates a, creates further con concern, particularly, um, uh, you know, as an age crept crept upwards. Well, I, I, I mean. It, it, it again comes back to first of all, what what are the consequences? What are the consequences of that finding? Um, if we're dealing with a, a child who is below the age at which we consider that a child has the capacity to commit a criminal offence, and the outcome of, of such a finding has no criminal consequences uh, for that child, then it may be. It may be uh, acceptable for for that to be established on the balance of probabilities, so that the the um, the child's behaviour can be appropriately addressed. That's really the essence of 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 of, of, of this proposal. It's undoubtedly the case that as the age goes up, as we're dealing with older cohorts, one is dealing with. Um, you know, anyone with, with experience of, of children will appreciate that um, you know, as the age goes up, um, not only d does the incidence of, uh, of um, uh, harmful behaviour increase, and our statistics show that, um, but also the, um, the meaning of, of, what the, of what has been done, um, if I put it that way, changes. Thank you, convener, and um, good morning, panel. My question follows on quite nicely from the line of questioning that Oliver Mandel has opened up, and that is around capacity. But I'm interested in how the criminal justice system assesses the capacity of a young person to understand the consequences of what they've done. Because we've heard lots of evidence that young people develop differently, and sometimes young people can be in their their 20s before they fully understand um, the consequences of, of, of their actions. Now, I accept that young people can understand the difference between right and wrong, but understanding the consequences of their actions is a completely different thing. And I wonder what tests and assessments are done to help the courts to determine whether a young person fully understands the, the consequences of their actions and what impact that has and how they're dealt with. Well, I, I, you, you may, uh, if I may say so, uh, um, an important point, and of course it's a, a feature of our current system that um, because we have this, uh, we, we have essentially options um, in, during, mm. in, in relation to that cohort of children who are between the age of criminal responsibility and the upper point at which the hearing system can deal with them. Mm -hmm. um, there's the opportunity for professional judgment to be exercised um, um, by prosecutors um, informing themselves through discussions of the sort that Anthony uh, described uh, yeah. earlier um, to inform themselves about the not only the circumstance of the offence and and all the all the fact but all the factors that um, the code outlines, um, including the um, circumstances of the child. Um, so that's at the stage of deciding hmm. which system the the, 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 the the case should be dealt with uh, through. Um, uh, when it comes to the court process itself, um, the courts have. Uh, 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 there the are a number of statutory modifications made to the court process um, um, or, or to the normal rules that apply, mm -hmm. which at least um, permit courts to take into account um, the fact that the accused is a child. And we have, for example, special measures when um, a, 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 a child gives evidence and, and, and special measures can apply to a child accused as to a child witness. Um, there are provision. Uh, the court has the power, probably an inherent power, um, uh, regardless of statute, to uh, make appropriate uh, modifications in terms of the, the actual trial process. And that will be informed by um, the defence lawyers who can communicate to the court particular uh, issues in relation to the child. And when it comes to a conviction and disposal, um, the court w will, uh, will have information 
um, in terms of um, social work reports um, and otherwise about the child and there are disposal options that are available including um, the court may uh, refer the matter to the uh, hearing system to be dealt with, uh, to be disposed of through the hearing system. And we see even in the most serious cases that ultimately um, the court may um, send the, the child to be dealt with through the hearing mm -hmm. system. Um, and there is a particular statute of provision which um, states that the court may only impose custody on a child if it is satisfied that um, uh, uh, no other no other disposal would mm. be appropriate. So there are a range of a range of um, particular adjustments that are made to the system, um, and um, it may be that um, if we're looking at raising the age of criminal responsibility, that that's that's a side of the equation that needs to be looked at, as well as the question mm. of, of whether it's right to deal with these cases through the hearing system. But that's to anticipate the kind of work that I think would be needed in order properly to <coughs> address whether our system will be equipped to deal with this particular cohort of cases appropriately and confidently. If I could maybe just add a couple of things following on from that. This, the Scottish Sentencing Council is currently engaged in a piece of work looking at sentencing practice in relation to, to, to young children and young offenders. And I, I know and I'm aware that that is very much driven by UNCRC considerations mm. uh, as well as broader public interest considerations. I, I don't know if you were, what you were maybe getting at was whether we take into account the fact that a child didn't, didn't realise the consequences mm -hmm. or took no account of the mm -hmm. consequences in deciding whether to prosecute mm -hmm. in the first place. Mm -hmm. and I think that, that's, that is, that's another good and interesting question because um, the capacity to understand um, that one is committing a criminal offence I think, I think is, is slightly different from mm -hmm. sits alongside a uh, a recklessness or an ignorance of the consequences mm -hmm. or a lack of capacity to understand the consequences. Yeah. And that would not necessarily mean, I think, that it, um, we would not prosecute. But, but how do you determine that? What, what do you take into account to determine well, that? We discuss, uh, we would, if it's, if it's a child who's been in contact with the hearing system, have that conversation that Anthony was talking about. And I've had, mm -hmm. I've had a long um, meeting with uh, one of our lead prosecutors who does this on a daily basis. So I'm, I'm confident that um, those discussions are, are full and detailed. Um, so we will get whatever information we can um, from whatever public agency has dealt with that child before, whether it's the hearing system, whether it's from the through the police, uh, from the family, from uh, the, the schools, teachers, and so on. Um, in appropriate cases, we would we would have a, a psychological examination. When, when out you say in appropriate cases, could could you explain what you mean? I take it that's not routinely done then. A psychological <laughs> assessment of a, of a young person who's committed a crime. Not a, not a specific psychological report on every child that is. Re reported to us jointly in relation to um, a criminal offence. And, and given the, the, I'm sorry for interrupting, but given the wealth of evidence there is that, that children develop differently mm -hmm. and, and young people's ability to understand the consequences can sometimes, as I said earlier, it can be in their, their late teens, early twenties. Why is it, is it not a routine um, part of the assessment process that a psychological test is done on a young person? Because it's you made the point yourself, children are different. Need to be need to be looked at on as an individual mm -hmm. and in the in the individual <coughs> circumstances. So, it 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 depends on the background, the circumstances, the child itself. Um, there is there is no <coughs> need for a universal test of that kind before the kind of decisions that we make in consultation with the the reporter, uh, the police, and so on. And it is also important, sorry to interrupt, uh, it, is also, it is important <coughs> that you know, we, we factor in all the circumstances and that has to include um, factors such as the gravity, seriousness and nature of the crime. So, for example, in the cohort of cases that I've 
referred to in, in my opening remarks, we have um, a, 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 an individual aged 13 who pled guilty to five charges of a, a assault and robbery or attempted robbery and a theft by housebreaking. Um, query whether one, you know, I mean, it's a, a, an interesting question whether one would need to have a psychological assessment to mm. determine whether that's a case that should or shouldn't stay in the criminal justice system. Um, we have a, a, another case in which the, uh, a 13-year-old was involved in a three accused premeditated robbery with knives of commercial premises. Um, we've got um, a, an exceptionally serious uh, case involving a 13-year-old um, who was uh, charged with murder, pled guilty to culpable homicide, uh, um, multiple stabbing of the child's foster parent. Um, the court took the view that, um, and because there's a statute provision in relation to custodial disposals, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a view that will have been reached after, I'm sure, careful consideration, that the <coughs> appropriate disposal was a 12-year extended sentence with a seven-year custodial element in relation to that particular um, particular case. And that's quite an important example because it illustrates that even in that 12 to 14 cohort, the appropriate disposal um, may include measures that extend beyond the 18th birthday of the, the child. And um, uh, as the uh, committee will be aware, the hearing mm -hmm. system can only impose measures or, or, or make orders that uh, last to the 18th birthday of the child. And that's one of the issues that I think uh, ought to be looked at carefully uh, as we uh, consider uh, the issue of, of a further increase or, uh, mm -hmm. uh, in the age of criminal responsibility. Just one tiny, tiny further. Um, I mean, well, we are now more aware of the, the impact of adverse childhood experiences. And, and I suppose I, I am still struggling to understand, if we, if we take into account a child's adverse childhood experiences, um, and, and if they are on a particularly um, severe range, why then um, would a child still be prosecuted um, if they have committed a crime? Who would determine whether or not a child with significant ACEs would have a psychological assessment. And if I think about the adult courts, the, the, the defence of, of diminished responsibility can still be used in certain cases. And I wonder if there is anything in, um, in, in the defence of, of young people where maybe not diminished responsibility exactly, but if you take into account the extent to which ACs have impacted on their understanding um, and their development, and that would mean instead of being prosecuted, they would be diverted somewhere else. Well, um, I, I suppose the point I've been at pains to emphasise mm. is that our current system supports um, careful and um, considered professional judgement um, in which most, the overwhelming bulk of children under 16 who commit offences are dealt with through the hearing system mm. entirely appropriately, and that is mm. a system that I strongly, strongly support um, with the welfare of the child as the, the paramount consideration um, for, the, for, 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 for the hearing. Mm. Um, so um, I, 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 think, I think what's key about our current system um, is that it supports careful and considered professional judgment, informed professional judgment, um, that seeks to do the right thing for each individual case. And I say case because, of course, in these most serious cases, there is a child who is an accused of the crime. And, of course, that's in everyone's uh, uh, mind who deals with the case. But there are also victims of the crime, um, and there is a um, and there is a wider public interest, and 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 this is where um, uh, uh, this is one of the reasons why the issue has to be considered very carefully. Um, there, there is a a question as the age goes up mm. whether a system that de treats the welfare of the child as the the paramount consideration mm -hmm. and excludes all other considerations. Um, is appropriate for dealing with this kind of case, 
that's a question on which I, you know, is, which is for others uh, to, 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 to make policy or to consider the policy of, but it's a serious, it's a mm -hmm. serious question. Um, there's a serious set of questions about whether the powers of disposal of the hearing system are adequate to deal with this particular cohort of cases. Um, and again, that's, that, that, that ultimately will be for others to, to consider, but it's something that needs to be considered. And the issue of, of um, the, um, you know, what happens at the age of 18 mm -hmm. is also something that will need to be considered. So a range of issues that need to be looked at with the same thoroughness that we've looked at the question of raising the age to 12. Um, before before we can, I think, safely take that decision and be confident that in doing so we will be meeting all our obligations, not only to the, ch the child who's accused and at the heart of these cases, but also to victims of crime and to the wider public interest. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Annie Wells had some questions about victims, I think, specifically, didn't you? I think the Lord Advocate has just answered the question just regarding public opinion and increasing the, the age. More thought has to go into it. Thank you. Thank you, Convener. Good morning to the panel. Thank you very much for taking the time to come and see us today. Lord Advocate, um, the, the the note of caution you've sounded today about going further than 12 is one we've heard before. Um, I think largely there's broad support across all state, the majority of stakeholders to see us go for, further than 12 with the caveat that we do the work first. That's why I've got a, a Sunrise Clause amendment which would bring in 12 and then 14 later that Gail Ross is going to ask a bit more about later. Um, but can I ask you in terms of the, the work that re is required, um, the, the one step we've taken on this journey so far was lifting the age of criminal prosecution to 12 uh, a number of years ago. Can I just ask about what preparatory work was needed for that and uh, whether there were any unforeseen consequences after it came in? Um, in terms of raising the age, the age of prosecution to 12, I'm afraid I don't, I don't I'm, I'm, I'm not um, familiar with the history of how that, uh, you know, what work was done in order to prepare for that. Have there but, been but any I, certainly, I can certainly look into that if that would be. Have there been any cases which um, the judiciary have felt, <coughs> goodness, we we should have, you know, that person should have been tried in a criminal court, or, or the system failed because we've lifted it to the age of criminal prosecution to twelve. Um, well, I, I, it wouldn't really come to the attention of the judiciary right, of because course. the nature of the decision to raise uh, the age of non-prosecution yeah. to 12 is that all those cases go into the into the hearing system. Um, I, I don't know whether anyone, any of us are aware of any cases, but I suppose the, the important thing that the data supports is that the, um, the incidence of... Um, um, cases of a seriousness that they're jointly reported increases with as the age cohort with the age cohort uh, now that's perhaps not a yeah. particularly surprising um, o observation um, and then uh, and within the that co those cohorts the number of cases that are prosecuted changes as the age cohorts go up um, so in the cohort 12 to 14 um, a very small number of cases are prosecuted but they're prosecuted for good reason. Um, and um, after the careful, you know, uh, as I've sought to emphasize, the, 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 the most careful uh, uh, consideration. And, and we have to be confident going forward that each of those cases can be dealt with confidently and appropriately within whatever, whatever landscape or system we, we have in place. Yeah. I, I could maybe just add, in terms of um, our experience, and Anthony might be able to correct me or, or supplement this, we will continue to have received reports of serious offending by 11-year-olds, mm -hmm. particularly in the context of serious sexual offending, um, where because of the age of criminal prosecution and, and then age of forthcoming age of criminal responsibility, we have to, to view that through a different lens in terms of what, what we can do with that. And I'm talking particularly in the context of serious sexual offending, which persists for years but has started at a very early age, and as the Lord Advocate has already mentioned, against very young children. So, so as an incidence, there, is, there has always been and there continues to be a limited amount of reporting of serious offending by very young children. 
Um, I, I think we've, we've, we've dealt with that within the legal framework, um, and particularly now there's, there's, we are able to perhaps lead evidence of that <laughs> without charging it as a, as a formal charge and seeking a conviction. So um, I, just, I just mention it to put on the record that that offending still is reported to us. That's very useful, thank you. Um, going back to the work that would be required to consider a further uplift um, in age of criminal uh, responsibility, um, you've there may be other, I mean, there may be a range of factors we need to consider, but the one thing that you consistently mentioned um, in this session is, of course, what happens um, when a child commits something so severe that the nature of the disposal may last for many years and take them beyond their 18th birthday. Um, that's been raised before by other stakeholders about a question we might need to answer, in, either in terms of further empowering the children's hearing system or, or whatever. Um, what kind of solutions would solve that problem? I think it would be premature for me to, okay. on the hoof, be trying to trying to formulate um, answers to that particular issue. I, I think it's not a straightforward issue because um, uh, it, 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 you know, by by its nature, it, in, it envisages uh, our disposal um, of some sort, which um, is. Um, uh, made by a hearing system, but which lasts um, well into what, what I think we would regard as uh, a, a adulthood. And of course, as the, you know, uh, if the age of, of criminal responsibility is increased, you know, the, the closer it's raised to, to 18, the more acute that becomes as a, a problem. But even in this young age group, 12 to 14, there are a couple of cases in the, 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 the examples I've been given where the disposal went beyond the 18th birthday. So I'm afraid I'm not going to be no, able to I give you um, a, a neat solution. It, it strikes me as quite a difficult a difficult um, question in policy terms. But I also do think, and, and, and I wouldn't want one to lose sight of, uh, uh, you know, two important questions. One is whether the, in, in the context of the kinds of cases that we're um, uh, with the weird we're thinking about at the most extreme end um, uh, uh, there is some thinking to be done about what would be required to equip the children's hearing system to deal with that if any and I, I use equip in its ab in its broadest sense um, but um, what, what would be required for the hearing system if that was where we felt that those cases should be dealt with um, uh, to, 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 to do so. Does it have the powers? It may not simply be a matter of formal powers, but does it have the powers that would be necessary to deal appropriately with such offending? Um, and um, the hearing system, of course, has the power to include a secure accommodation authorization in a compulsory supervision order, but can't require that the child be kept in secure accommodation. Um, uh, um, and I suppose a bit lying behind that is the more fundamental issue of principle, which I mentioned with in answer to one of Mary Fee's questions, which is um, whether or not it is correct, and, and I raise it simply as a question, I don't propose an answer, whether it is correct that cases of the sort that I've described um, should be dealt with with the welfare of the child as effectively the sole consideration subject only to public protection. Yeah. I think there's a really important discussion for us collectively as a society to have about uh, uh, that question. I understand, and forgive me for putting you on the spot, but it's not an insurmountable problem from, from what you said. That there's a lot of work to be done, but we'll get, hopefully get there. Quick question to the Procurator Fiscal, if I may. I know you wanted to bring in uh, Gil Ross. Um, can I ask Anthony McGeehan, uh, in terms of the uh, cases that are jointly referred, this is about cost, because we had heard that um, if we shifted the sort of uh, the workload that is currently dealt with um, through the criminal courts and through your organisation entirely to the Children's Reporters Administration and the children's hearing system, that there would be a burden of cost on them. I, I just wanted to see, and you might not have these statistics available right now, but what kind of uh, revenue is directed in your organisation to dealing with cases that are jointly referred to both organisations? I don't have specific figures to date. We, we can work on the cost for individual cases by forum. 
Um, the challenge within uh, the, the, the figures that are currently available to us is that, um, as Lord has already, already indicated, in relation to um, children aged 12 or 13 at the time of report, uh, since 2011-12, uh, 1,285 accused persons have been reported. Um, and as again, as the Lord Advocate has indicated, only 27 cases uh, were raised or, or proceedings commenced before the courts. Um, but COPFS will have invested time and resources, not only in the 27 cases in which proceedings were initiated, <coughs> but also in our consideration and dialogue with the report in relation to the most appropriate outcome for the remaining cases. Um, so it may be quite a difficult figure to um, confidently state, but in relation to numbers of cases that reported to us, numbers of cases that we commence proceedings in, we have that data and could work on some broad figures, as we do for any other type of change. I think that would certainly be very helpful in terms of prepar preparation of the financial memorandum. So if you could provide any clarity on that, that would be great. I'm quite happy to see to get Ross. Thank you. Thank you, convener. And um, as is usual, when you go last, you're <laughs> sweeping up a couple other things. Good morning, panel. Um, I just want to thank you for your evidence. I mean, in, in as is normal with things like this, you read it in, on paper, but your evidence is actually given it a, a, a real life angle and that's extremely important for us. Um, just in terms of the, I, I want to, to go back to something that we spoke about with the victims and the, the serious um, cases that are dealt with. How do we, how do we deal with the public perception if we're going to go beyond 12 to either 14 or 16, that we can give the public a sense of reassurance that these cases are still going to be dealt with in the manner that they're dealt with at the moment? Um, well, I think that, that that's a really important point. There are perhaps two different um, observations that I would make in answer to that. The first is that... Um, um, there's the broad public perception of the system and confidence in the system, and it is, of course, immensely important that public confidence is supported and maintained in the system as a whole. That's one of the reasons why um, it seems to me that it's really important to do the, do the spade work um, before taking a decision um, o o on this. Um, and, indeed, it's one of the reasons why the... It's it, 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 one of the reasons the Law Commission gave um, when it looked at this for retaining the right to prosecute um, uh, uh, children is that that enhances confidence in both parts of the system. Um, um, and, of course, Lord Kilbrandon also recommended that that, uh, that should be retained. So th there's the general question of maintaining public confidence in the system. Ultimately, I'm not an expert in how you maintain public confidence, um, that's very much a, a matter that um, uh, uh, you will no doubt want to consider, but, but um, it does seem to me from my perspective that doing the work and making sure we have the mechanisms and the powers and the structures in place that ensure that however we configure the system, um, if, it, if it requires to be reconfigured um, for, 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 for this cohort. Um, uh, that the, 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 um, the public kind of confidence that every case will be dealt with appropriately, including the most serious, is a really that's a really important thing. It's also important not to lose sight of the individual victims of, of crimes, um, and I, I think what we are acutely conscious of, because prosecutors have <coughs> to have conversations with the victims of crime about the way in which the case is dealt with. And if one is dealing with a, a, a serious assault um, or, or a rape, um, one has to, if one raises the age of criminal responsibility, one is contemplating saying to the victim, um, what happened to you was not a crime and it's going to be dealt with in this way. Now, ultimately, we have to make decisions in the public interest, but one has to... Um, one has to consider. One has to consider when thinking about the public confidence in the system, um, the um, 
responsibility that we have to victims to, to uh, have a system which, um, which, 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 which um, uh, in which what, the, the, what has been done to them can be explained and to them in a way that is um, are, are appropriate. I don't know, Alison or Anthony, whether there's anything you'd want to add. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really important point. Um, I think we've come a long way as a society in terms of what Mary Fee was asking about about a, a real appreciation of adverse childhood experiences and the need to prevent this offending in the first place. The need to you know get it right for every child, all of that. But the Lord Advocate's absolutely right. Um, where uh, you know a life has been taken, where a child has been raped where somebody has been left with life-changing injuries, where from their perception, as having lived the experience of that assault, um, to, be, to be told, well, he's a child, he didn't know what he was doing or he didn't appreciate the consequences, that's a very difficult message to, to get across. Um, it's a very difficult message to convey, to, to set the scene and explain why certain actions are, are being taken short of their expectations. But nevertheless, I, I have to say, from, again, from personal experience, um, victims equally, in my experience, understand the need for action to be taken so that nobody go, has to go through what they go through again. Exactly. So I, 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 I give victims the benefit of, of um, a really good understanding, <coughs> an intelligent understanding of what, what we really need to do in response to that offending in, a, in the wider public interest. And I think if we could get the message across that <coughs> dealing with the child in a welfare system addresses those needs, you know, has a better <coughs> chance of, of preventing reoffending. That's that's one part of the narrative which I think um, could could usefully usefully be developed. It's, it's perhaps an important point, if I may, just add to to to, to, to that. Um, uh, in other parts of our system crimes are committed and the perpetrator can't be held responsible. If, if the perpetrator is um, incapable through mental illness, um, then um, he, won't, he or she won't be held responsible for the crime. It remains our crime um, equally currently with the um, cases where the child is below 12. We can't prosecute. It's characterised as a crime which can't be prosecuted through the criminal courts. Um, so we're very familiar with the idea of crimes that are committed, but where the perpetrator can't be held responsible for good reasons. Um, um, one of the consequences of raising the age of criminal responsibility um, is that we, for, for very good reason in relation to the, 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 the children um, under 12 to whom this bill relates to, um, we, we proceed on the basis that the child is incapable of committing a crime. It's not, it's essentially, essentially it's not a crime, and that's why we, we've got the investigative powers in the bill, um, so that the police can still investigate that, even though we no longer, we don't think of it as a, a crime. So there may be something about, as, as the Solicitor General says, about um, um, the thinking carefully about how we characterise um, harmful behaviour at different ages um, uh, in relation to different age cohorts um, and um, developing a, 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 a strong narrative about the response to that behaviour which is most effective and most appropriate for, for, for dealing, with, uh, dealing with the case, but in a way which continues to um, command confidence in the way that I would like to think our system currently does. Um, and just on um, the, the clause that Alec Cole Hamilton mentioned, um, if we were obviously to go straight to 14, there would need to be a time scale to do the work. So um, the clause says that we go to 12 now because that work has been done and it's extremely in depth and took a lot of time. Um, so moving on then to go to a higher age, whether that's 14 or 16, whatever the research bears out, 
should there be a time scale put on that? Would that concentrate minds or would it place an unnecessary burden? How, how do you see that working? And given that there's already um, research done to go to 12, would the same amount of research have to be done or would you be able to draw on some of the evidence that's there already? Um, I don't think it would be right for, 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 for me to, um, uh, to, to, to try and be prescriptive about the nature, scope and scale of the work that will be needed um, um, to, to, to do this. I think I can identify some of the questions that would need to be thought about. I really, it, it really is, I'm afraid, for, 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 for others, for, for particularly for ministers with direct policy responsibility, I think, to help the committee. Um, a, a about the um, kind of process that would be required and possible timescales for this kind of work. I think what, what we, we can certainly do, and, and following on from Malcolm Schaefer's evidence to, to you uh, the other day, is to is to c commit to working cooperatively oh. to providing whatever data is needed, whatever further insights, <coughs> practitioners professional prosecutors' insights into this. I think there, I think there are different, different issues with um, the 12 and 13 year olds to 11 year olds and equally there are even yet more different issues in relation to 14 and 15 year olds, both in terms of uh, numbers and uh, character and, um, and, and, and legal issues. So I don't think it's necessarily just a little bit of supplementary <coughs> To what the advisory group did did with with younger, I think I think as as the age as the Lord Advocate says gets closer to the age at which the children's hearing system can deal with them, the the issues get knottier and 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 more of them. Um, but but we are again discussing this before we we came in. We are for all sorts of reasons. This is this is part of a direction of travel that I think we as as prosecutors are committed to to, to join. To, to reduce the number of children in the criminal justice system, um, and certainly in terms of getting the work done, which is what you're talking about, I think I think there there is there, there is a sense of urgency, frankly, from from my own experience of working in this area, so that I think there would be a will to to do the work quickly but thoroughly. OK, thank you very much for, for your evidence this morning. That draws our, our first panel to a close, and we'll suspend briefly to change over. Thank you.
Yes. Welcome back, everybody, and can I welcome Bruce Adamson, Children and Young Persons Commissioner, Scotland. Um, can I invite you to make an opening statement of up to five minutes, Commissioner? Uh, thank you, Convener, and, and, and Happy New Year to, to the committee. Um, this year is an important year in children's rights terms. It's the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. The international commitment that we made to, to all children to create a legal framework that they could all grow up in an environment of happiness, love and understanding. Um, and that speaks very importantly to the work that this committee has been doing on the age of criminal responsibility, because the commitment we have to children and young people is to keep them all safe and to support them and keep them from harm, but also when they do conduct harmful behaviour, to make sure that they are treated as children. And in particular, Article 40 of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child calls on all states to treat children in conflict of the law in a manner consistent with the child's rights, respect for human, for child's sense of dignity and worth, and which reinforces their respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms of others, taking into account their age and a desirability for promoting their reintegration and them assuming a constructive role in society. And so the age of criminal responsibility is, is an essential part of that. When we're talking about the harmful behavior of children and young people, I think we should see that primarily as a failure of the state. Things have gone wrong in terms of the support that that child has had. And it concerns me that sometimes we seem to um, suggest that this should be an individual responsibility, that that child should be held to accountable as if it wasn't part of broader failure. Um, as a number of committee members have already said, um, our growing understanding of adverse childhood experiences and the complexity of some children's lives, I think means that our focus should be very much on what's happened in the child's life and treating them as a child. Um, this is something that the international community over the last 30 years um, has been particularly focused on. Um, and we've spoken about the, the draft general comment, which is currently being considered in Geneva. Um, but it's much broader than that. So at the United Nations level, the, the Human Rights Council, the charter side of the United Nations, made up of other member states, has consistently challenged the position in Scotland and in the UK about our very low age of criminal responsibility. Um, and the committee itself, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, and you'll be hearing later from Anne Skelton, a very distinguished um, human rights defender and member of that committee, about their work, but has consistently condemned the position in Scotland and the UK for having an age of criminal responsibility of eight. When, over a decade ago, they developed the, uh, the general comment number 10, um, where they said that taking into account all of the international evidence... Um, which was um, considerable, that 12 was the absolute minimum at that stage, and that 14 or 16, based on that strong evidence, based on their consideration of, um, of global trends and what was happening and our growing understanding of children and young people, that 14 or 16 was delivering better results in keeping people safe, in reducing crime, um, and in treating children and young people as children. Um, the revision of that draft, which again um, Anne Skelton will, will speak to this afternoon, um, was something we've known about for a very long time. The committee was very concerned that states were misinterpreting the general comments as 12 being a target. It was never intended to be so. And they will be very clear that, um, that 14 is the minimum standard um, for all state parties to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Um, the committee's meeting in Geneva as we speak, and it is expected that they will approve that general comment um, revision either in this session or at the latest in the next session. Um, all of the evidence that's gone into that is available on the, the UN's website. At the Council of Europe level, um, the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe was very clear that, that, that for European countries and the, the 47 um, members of the Council of Europe, that 14 was the standard in 2014. Um, so for European countries, including the UK, that was the standard. And um, as the committee um, is aware, um, the Council of Europe's Commissioner for Human Rights, um, Danja Mjatovic, um, has actually directly engaged both with ministers and with this committee, expressing her concern that Scotland is not following the Council of Europe standard, um, which has been 14 since at least 20. 14. So the international community could not have been clearer that 14 was the minimum standard based on all of the, all of the international evidence. 
um, and that we should look to go further because the evidence supports that. Um, the domestic um, evidence is, is, is again strong, and I, I think that uh, the additional evidence that the committee has received um, from um, a number of, of the um, distinguished bodies across civil society in Scotland and academia in Scotland, I, I think, is, is very strong in supporting a, a raising of an age of criminal responsibility beyond what is currently in the bill. Um, and I think that uh, 14, with a view to looking to, to 16, is where we should be. Um, the evidence from the Edinburgh, um, the Edinburgh study shows that those global trends, that global evidence that the UN looked at, that the Council of Europe looked at, are, are true in Scotland. So we have domestic evidence. The committee's also, also heard directly from, um, from children and young people um, and adults who entered the criminal justice system as young people. And I think all of that um, speaks very, very strongly to the consideration of moving further than the current proposal of 12. Thank you. Alec. Thank you very much, Kamina. Good morning, uh, Bruce, uh, Commissioner. Um, can I ask, uh, well, f first and foremost, in this sort of secondary tranche of evidence we've taken, there has been broad support from stakeholders to go further than 12, as you've described. The one note of caution that's been sounded was repeated in the session you've just heard from the Lord Advocate about uh, the requirement to do uh, some work. And, and there was an anxiety, I think, that uh, uh, among parties that the first original advisory group that got us prepared for 12 took a number of years to do that work. I wonder, your organi I mean, you personally weren't involved, but your office was, and I'm sure the organisational memory comes with you, um, as to what the kind of parameters of that original advisory group were. Were they told to stop at 12? Um, did they take that long because they were given an open-ended, said, you don't have to rush, we want it back within the next two or three years? Or is it the work was very intense, or are they just very busy people? Do you have a, a, a reflection as to why that took so long to do that prep work? Uh, I think it was um, an issue of regret that the government framed the advisory group's remit in such a way as it did to, to restrict it to 12. Um, I think that was a mistake, and I think that that mistake has, has led us to, to where we are now to some extent. Um, in terms of the work of the advisory group, um, in, in terms of the time frame, my understanding was it wasn't uh, that long in terms of the actual work of the group, but the follow-up um, response, I'm kind of drafting the bill and bringing it forward, took, took, took a period of time. But that actually the, the work of the group was, was able to be done reasonably, reasonably quickly. Um, I think that having spoken to, um, reflecting on that institutional memory within my office, um, but also having spoken to a number of the advisory group members, um, many of whom supported a, a raise of the age of criminal responsibility higher than 12, um, they, they kept that in mind, and so that advisory group was breaking new ground. We hadn't looked at this um, in terms of what it would practically mean to raise the age criminal responsibility for, for a, a very long time. And so they were starting to, to unpick, to look at what some of the unforeseen consequences are, and to set out the framework for, for what this would mean. All of those things apply equally to a higher age of criminal responsibility. Um, where the additional work, in my view, needs to be done um, is around looking at the resources that, that need to be provided. Um, so, so looking at the prevalence and the types of, um, types of cases that we're looking at and um, very much looking at what needs to be put in place to support those children and young people. Um, the, the comments made towards the end of, of, of the last session, and which have been made consistently by civil society organisations, um, that prevention is the key here. That what we need to do is to support children and young people and their families and their communities to make sure they don't go on to conduct harmful behaviour. That's how we keep everybody, everybody safe. And we need to do more, more work, and more work is being done around how we do that. But that, that's really the key to this. By the time that we get to the type of harmful behaviour that we classify as, as criminal behaviour, something's already gone, gone horribly wrong, um, but we do need to look at how to, to address that. And I think that the work that needs to be done that Malcolm Schaefer um, from the Children's Reporters Administration spoke about um, last week in terms of kind of looking at the numbers of these cases and what additional resources would be needed for the Reporters Administration, I, I think are key. He suggested that that, that would be you know, a, a, period of, a period of months, depending on what we, we were looking at. But it, it very much focused on the resources that were, um, that were needed. Um, I think the, the, the comments around... Um, disposals that relate to children um, after they're no longer children and the, um, the challenge that we have in relation to perhaps older children, if the age of criminal responsibility was, was raised significantly, um, older children 
very quickly moving beyond that 18 and um, out with the any disposal available to the children's hearing system. Um, so I think that there is there is some, some work to be done around that, but I think it needs to be set within the context of what's the purpose here of, um, of the criminal justice system and what's the purpose of um, addressing children's harmful behaviour. And if the key thing is ensuring that this behaviour is addressed, then we know from the evidence that actually a criminal justice approach does not work as well as a welfare-based approach. So actually the welfare-based things that we need to be putting in, that's what the additional work needs to be, needs to be focused on. Um, I do accept that um, particularly if we're looking for a significant raise beyond, beyond 14, um, then there, there is more work to be done and that might take, take longer, particularly around strengthening the powers and the resources um, for addressing that harmful behaviour. But the move to 12 to 14, um, I would not foresee as, as creating an insurmountable barrier um, to, to moving this forward. 14 is the minimum international standard, and I think, as I say, the international community has been very clear there is no excuse to have an age of criminal responsibility below 14. It is not compatible with international law, and to some extent it could be seen as, as showing contempt to international law to, to pass a law which says that our age of criminal responsibility is 12 when the international community has been so clear and has engaged Scotland specifically to say that 14 is the lowest that would be acceptable. Um, so I think the, the move to 14 um, is, is necessary and immediate, um, but I do accept that additional work may need to be done um, to look at uh, an age higher than 14, and I think the, the type of um, time frame talked about in relation to the amendments in terms of the sunrise clause um, would be sufficient to a allow for that to happen. I'm just going to briefly, if I may, mm. yeah, just, of course. Uh, I suppose I just would want to be clear that our children's hearing system is not a criminal justice forum. And Malcolm Schaefer was very clear last week yep. that it's not about punishment and retribution, it's about um, treatment and, and rehabilitation. So I suppose we just wouldn't want to be yeah. speaking as if it was a criminal justice forum. No, you know I mean? You want to be really clear that the hearing system is there for rehabilitation and, and treatment of young people. Absolutely. And, and when the European Court of Human Rights has looked at this, they've made that point very clearly that while the um, children's hearing system does have some characteristics of, of a, a criminal system. It is a civil system and is based around the paramountcy of the welfare of the child, and I think it's something we should be very proud of. I myself was a panel member for 13 years, um, and I, I'm very proud of what the children's hearing system does. I think uh, what I was, was, was intending to say was, was more that, that kind of holistically, when we're talking about children who conduct harmful behaviour, that, that's what we should be talking about. We're talking about children whose harmful behaviour is a product of our failure to give them the support that they needed. And as such, a welfarist approach to that is what we should be doing. And in fact, the evidence shows that actually it's the most effective. So not only is it the right thing to do in human rights terms, treating the child as a child, also the evidence shows that that's the most effective thing in terms of changing their behaviour. That a criminal justice approach, even applied um, by a very respectful um, prosecutorial service, as we have in Scotland, that, that, that um, presented very strong evidence um, today around the way in which they take a very sensitive approach to the prosecution of children, um, we're still prosecuting children. And the, 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 nature, of the, the nature of taking a criminal justice approach um, is contrary to children's human rights, um, particularly with younger children, um, and does not deliver the results. Um, that we need. A welfare approach delivers better results and the evidence, I think, um, from a number of the bodies that, that have submitted um, domestically um, is very, very strong on that. Um, thank you. Um, so, further to my first question, are you content that the original advisory group um, would be sufficient to consider this extra amount of work, uh, perhaps with the addition of the procurator fiscal, given the, the joint referrals that higher ages bring? Would, would they be um, equipped sufficiently to deal with the, the, the deep dive into these issues? Or would you think a new group with different membership and remit would be established? Um, I, I don't have a firm view on that, to be honest. I, th I think a number of the, of the, um, of the duty bearer, the, the, the agencies in, involved, which, ha which have the information and would need to do work themselves, I think they should be doing that right now, and they have been, which is, which is useful. So actually this, this work should be happening, happening anyway. Um, in terms of the advisory group to advise government on on this, um, yeah, I think that's probably a matter for, for for government in terms of how best to to shape that. I think that the advisory group, as previously formed, was um, had uh, exceptional expertise, and they 
approached the, the process with diligence. I think, as I say, it's a matter of significant regret that their, their remit was restricted in the way that it was. Um, and I think, that, as I say, I think that that is problematic. Um, there are others that have expertise as well. Um, I think the, the, the key thing for me is that, um, that we do avoid unintended consequences. We do consider all the things that this committee has been um, asking of witnesses in terms, in terms of what would happen, particularly for older children. Um, the the um, consideration of, of victims, which always has to be at the forefront of our, of our minds, um, and, and what, are, what are their needs in terms of securing an effective remedy. Um, but, but most of that work's, work's been done in kind of conceptual level. Most of that work's contained within the report. So what, if what we're doing is talking about the, the move to, to 14 or to 16, so we're just looking at the, the additional things, um, I'm, I'm not convinced that, that those are, are insurmountable barriers. Great. A couple more questions, if I may. You referenced the letter from the uh, Human Rights Commissioner of the Council of Europe that this committee received on the weekend, mm. um, and uh, it, it references an exchange between herself and the Minister um, on this subject, and the Minister replied to the Commissioner stating that the, we had a very unique situation in Scotland, that our children's hearings uh, system is, is world-regarded, and be that as it may, we have a lot to be proud of. Um, the Commissioner re replied saying there are unique examples in every country, and and it doesn't really make us particularly special and doesn't give us a pass. Um, do you agree with that assessment? Should our unique children's hearing system for all its uh, positive aspects give us a pass which absolves us of meeting that international minimum standard? No. Um, I think that the, the Council of Europe Commissioner's letter was very clear on this in, in her letter to the, um, to, to the committee that the whole point of having international minimum standards is that they apply to everyone. Nobody gets an exemption. Um, and I think it is very important that, that while we give um, important weight to the UN framework, and, as, and Anne Skelton will speak to that this afternoon, um, and their absolute clarity on this point as well, that minimum standards are minimum standards that apply um, irregardless of... Um, of the other good things that you should be doing, you don't. It's not. It's not that if you're doing some good things, you're allowed to, to do bad things as well. It's that you've, when you've got minimum standards, they apply across the board. Um, you should as well be doing the other things to ensure that all children um, in conflict with the law are treated as children, and there's a welfareist approach. And and many of those things we've talked about, not just the children's hearing system, but also the the, the way in which we approach prosecution. Um, are, are very strong in, in children's rights terms and have been recognised as such. Um, but all 47 <coughs> members are member states of the, of the Council of Europe, all 193 members of, of, of the, the United Nations, um, all have different, um, different strengths and weaknesses, all have unique systems within them. Some of them have fantastic um, welfare systems for, for, for child justice as well, and all of those um, positives should be, should be congratulated. It doesn't allow you then to say, because we have that strength there, we, um, we're allowed to um, go below the minimum standard. And I think that the, we have to be very clear here that 14 is the minimum standard. It's not, it's not human rights leadership, it's not progressive, it's the minimum standard um, at the Council of Europe and very soon to be the minimum standard globally. Um, and so that is, everyone has to do that, no matter what else you're doing. And I, and I think that, um, that there's a lot to be proud of in Scotland, um, but I think we do run the risk, and, and we've seen this in other cases in relation to criminal justice, um, particularly in relation to, to the, the Carter case, where we'd said actually, um, because of the other protections built into our criminal justice system, we don't have to provide the minimum standard of legal representation um, when in, in, police, in police custody. And, and the court was very clear that that's not the case. You, you, can't, you can't say just because we're very strong in other protections that that in totality allows us to go below a minimum standard. Um, Fulton McGregor has a brief supplementary. Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, um, and Good morning. Um, good morning. I, I, I wanted just to pick up a, um, a supplementary on Alex Cole Hamilton's point there. Uh, as part of my other committee work, um, it was the Justice Committee who we went to Norway to see the Barnhouse model, and one of the questions that came up through that was <clears throat> asking them about their age of criminal responsibility. Now, in Norway, it's 15, but I was quite struck to note that they have provision uh, within their laws to deal with serious offences criminally, and they actually do it through the Barn Barnhouse model. And I wondered, actually, following on from Alex Cohamlin's point, if, if essentially the Scottish system and the Norwegian system and probably all systems are actually at the same place, but the focus here through this is on a specific focus on the age 
rather than the welfare of the child, which is what we all want. Um, ultimately, we, me and you will probably share a, a fairly similar value based on that. And I, I wonder if that's that's something to think about because actually the Norwegian system is pretty uh, has got the same safeguards in place, although their age is 15. Yeah, um, I, I think there's, there's there's a lot of really important. Um, uh, points in that. And so the, the, the Barnhill system, which, which Scotland is, is, is looking to and is, is prevalent across um, um, Nordic countries, um, who have generally higher ages of criminal responsibility, is a very effective way of, um, of addressing some very serious behaviour in terms of both supporting victims, but also looking um, to those children who have, har have harmful behaviour. Um, the, the Icelandic model where this kind of came from, again, their age of criminal responsibility is, is, is 15. Um, there's been a lot written about that, about the challenges of those that are below, that those that are above the age of criminal responsibility, treating them, they have to be treated differently within the system because of the welfarist approach. And it's actually harder to work with them because um, of the, the risk of, of criminalisation. Um, the, the point around having a higher age of criminal responsibility with exceptions built into it, which some countries do have and which the government has, has commented on um, and others um, in their responses, um, saying even though Scotland has a low age of criminal responsibility, um, we don't generally prosecute because we have the hearing system. Some states have a very high age of criminal responsibility, but then they have lots of exceptions to it, and so in practice it's the same. The committee has been, um, been as, has condemned as strongly those countries as well. Um, you cannot have exceptions that allow you to, to effectively, in practice, reduce the age of criminal responsibility. Those things are equally, equally wrong, um, particularly if those exceptions go below the minimum standard. Um, of 12, soon to be 14 in, in UN terms, but, but 14 already in, in Council of Europe terms. Um, and, and so I think that, that's something to, to, to stress as well, is that were we to a, raise the age of responsibility and then put in place a number of exceptions for, for, for serious harmful behaviour, that would be equally wrong. Um, the key thing is about ensuring that, that children who conduct harmful behaviour, um, that that's prevented in the first place, um, but that if it does take place, that, that they get the support to ensure that their behaviour changes um, on a long-term basis, and a welfarist approach is the best way of doing that. OK, we'll bring Alec back in. Thank you, Convener. Um, going back to the, the discussion around the work that would be required that a number of uh, stakeholders have intimated to us, and you've, and you've referenced yourself, um, uh, amendments appeared in the Daily List yesterday in my name, um, both for 14 and 16 respectively, on a phased implementation basis, answering Malcolm Sheffer's concerns that we, we shouldn't delay in, in lifting to 12, but then uh, creating in a sunrise clause which would lift us to 14 and 16 respectively on 18 months after oil ascent, effectively giving us two years uh, to to do us that work, but with the understanding that there would be a moratorium on the imposition of longitudinal criminal records for anyone in the age bracket we'd agreed. Um, would that be sufficient to answer the concerns of the Council of Europe in terms of their, the urgency with which they've told us to lift to 14? Um, and do you think that that would provide um, whatever working group was established sufficient amount of time to answer the questions you've identified? Uh, my answer to that is, I suppose, it, it depends on which amendments you're talking about. You've, you've, you've lodged a, a series of amendments. Um, those that set the age at 12 with a sunrise to, to 14 um, in future, the answer is no. Um, this is a, a minimum standard, which, again, is... Um, is 10 years old, more than 10 years old, that the idea that it was absolute <coughs> minimum was 12 and that you should, should move upwards. The, the, the standard at the UN level, again, the UN committee is very clear um, that, that, that um, even 14 shouldn't be a target. You should be looking, be looking further to that. So, and then the Council of Europe level, I think that the, the commissioner could not have been clearer um, and in terms of saying that 14 is immediate as in now. Um, and anything less than that would be below the, the standard expected by the Council of Europe. Um, so the amendments that you put in that would say 14 now with, with a view to raising it higher than that, then, then I think that that type of progressive approach and kind of reasonable approach to making sure the work gets done, I think that does make sense. But something that delayed the, the raise of the age of responsibility to 14, um, I, I would find problematic. I think this, le this legislature passing a piece of legislation which endorses 12 goes directly in the face um, of all of the international um, uh, communities engagement and, and I think that, that we shouldn't um, we shouldn't underestimate the seriousness of international bodies like the UN committee 
and the commissioner engaging directly and publicly. Um, a lot of this work goes on behind the scenes, and in this case, a lot of work did go on behind the scenes in advance, but by the time you get to a public letter um, on, the, on the Council of Europe website, um, that level of intervention is very, very serious. And, and while the language is, is often diplomatic, I don't think we understate just how much concern in the international community there is about an approach that would lead us to legislation which stated um, 12 as an age of criminal responsibility even if in a few years' time it was going to, to raise higher than that. And I think that, that for all of the, the reasons I've already set out and have been discussed at length um, around that it's, it's not the, the right approach, it doesn't respect children, children's rights, but also the message that it sends to 12-year-old to children, um, I think, I think that, that's really powerful um, as well. Okay. Bring in Oliver Mundell. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, you talk about a lot of work going on uh, behind the scenes. Um, I just wondered when uh, you first became aware that the UN was planning to uh, issue a new comment um, and, 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 and whether you were aware of th that they were looking at, f at 14 as an absolute minimum in that. Um, it, it, it's, been, it's been understood for many years that the general comment was going to be reviewed um, and that um, there was serious concern expressed um, yeah, over, over many years about a misinterpretation of current general comment 10 um, and that um, some states taking the, the, the one sentence which says 12 and not reading in the context which says is the absolute minimum right now and states need to move above that, no one should move down to 12. Um, and some concern that, that, that some states had sought to reduce their age of responsibility to 12, most of whom reversed that decision very quickly when they, they saw that it wasn't effective. So it's long been understood that the revision was coming. Um, it's long been understood that it would be this year. Um, I had conversations with, with, with ministers and senior civil servants alerting them to, the, to this fact. I've, I've spoken to members of th this committee that we, that we knew that it was coming. Um, what we didn't know was the exact um, timing of it, and what we didn't know was the exact, um, the, the pinning it to 14. So we knew, we knew that it was going to say higher than, than 12. Um, but until the, the draft was released um, at about the same time that the, the, the parliament was considering stage one, um, uh, the actual text of it um, was only available to state parties. Um, and uh, it was only publicly available um, shortly after that, and so I, I didn't receive an advanced copy. Um, but uh, we knew that it was coming. We knew the, the general ten tenor of, of it. Um, also, at the um, day of general discussion um, in Geneva last year, a number of members of the, the, the committee, including Anne, Anne Skelton, um, but also Amal Aldasiri um, and Makiko Otani, who came to Scotland, um, have had a number of meetings with, 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 with Scottish ministers. Some of those have, have, been, have been public. Um, so I think, I think it's been very clear for a long time um, that this was coming. The timing and the specifics were, were, um, were less clear, but, but this didn't come as any surprise. And I think very importantly is the Council of Europe as well. As a Council of Europe member state, um, we've signed up to those standards as well. And when we're looking at the UN standard, that's the standard that, that 192 of the 193 countries have signed up to. So we had to, get, we have, had to, had to focus on that. So, so generally, a UN standard will often be lower than a, a European one, um, just based on the nature of, of, of membership. And so we've, we've known for a, for a number of years that 14 was the Council of Europe standard. So uh, wh wh why then, in, in your view, if, if, you, if you've given warnings and these meetings have taken place, what, I mean, why, why did this bill end up being introduced um, as is with an age of 12 on, on, on a timescale, you know, in a year where, where, where there was going to be a revision uh, that, 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 was, that was sort of widely known about? Uh, I, I can't speak to I can't speak to 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 that, I, and, and I wouldn't like to, to speculate. But it's been a source of frustration when I when I took um, up this post um, just over eighteen months ago. It was one of the first things I spoke about that I had very serious concerns that with the age of criminal responsibility, with physical punishment of children, um, that these were, were long standing concerns, and I was very concerned that the approach that we were taking um, was the wrong one. I, 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 I've been very very public with this. I've in every meeting that I've had with Scottish ministers, I've, I've raised this. Um, my answer is I, 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 I don't, I, I, it's, a, it's a huge source of frustration to me that we are where we are and that the remit of the advisory group was restricted in the way that it, it, it was and that we end up with legislation which is putting us in a, in a position where we're discussing something that's below the, the international standard. Um, but, but I can't speak to, to, to why that's happened. I, I, again, um, discussions within, within this place around what is, is possible and the real politic of, of saying what, what's acceptable, um, what's popular, 
um, sometimes comes into conflict with, 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 with human rights standards. And what, what, what's your um, advice to the committee in relation to that? Because I mean, I, I, I would be concerned, and again, listening uh, to the Lord Advocate this morning, you know, around public confidence in, in the system and the importance of uh, leaving at least the option of prosecution open. I mean, he was pretty clear, I felt, in, in, in saying that, that that was important uh, to the public. Um, what, 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 what do you say to, to, to members of the parliament you know, who, who do have to balance up uh, the public interest tests and, and, and how the population as a whole feels? What, what do you say to them? Is that uh, are, are, are people living in Scotland's views less important uh, than, than, than the, the views of people sitting on the, the UN uh, committees? Um, I'll, I'll take that last part of your question maybe, se maybe separately yeah. um, and, and answer the, the, the broader question. Um, I think what, what's really important and, and the, the powerful evidence that, that the Lord Advocate, um, Solicitor General, and, um, and the fiscal gave was, was, was really important. It comes from a, a prosecutorial um, view. I, I started my own career as a prosecutor in, in New Zealand, and I think that, that prosecution, criminal prosecution certainly has a role. But we're talking about, about children here, and I think that the, the public discussion that needs to be had and the political discussion that needs to be had is what is the point, um, what's, what's the purpose behind the use of the criminal law to address someone's behaviour? And if the purpose, um, which I believe it is, and which I, which I have heard strongly from victims, um, is around addressing that behaviour, changing that behaviour. When we're talking about children, if the purpose is that, criminal prosecution doesn't work. It's not the Edinburgh um, study on um, transgestion and youth justice um, showed that very clearly in all the international evidence. So this is an evidence-based view that actually a welfare-based approach to dealing with children's behaviour is more effective in dealing with that element of justice um, in terms of saying actually one of the points of, of, of justice is ensuring that, that there's going to be non-repetition, that actually this isn't going to happen to me again and it's not going to happen to other people, that, that this behaviour of this person is going, is going to change. That's one of the fundamental principles um, of justice. And actually, the prosecuting a child, we know, doesn't work. It actually makes, makes um, recidivism more likely. And, and so I think that's, that's got to be part of this discussion as well. It, it, it's not about um, avoiding responsibility. It's not about not addressing the behaviour. It's about the most effective way of changing that behaviour. And that's the discussion that we need to have is, what does the criminal justice system add? We know the negatives of, of um, involving children too early in the criminal justice system. You've, you've heard direct testimony from, from adults that have been affected by that and from, from children um, of the, the, the lifelong stigmatisation and, and, and the impact that they've had. And, um, so so we, we know the negatives of, of, of criminal justice. What does, what does criminalising children add, though? Um, I, th I think there's, there's less on that side of, of the balance. Um, some of what the, the Lord Advocate and Solicitor General um, were talking about, though, in terms of saying some of this very harmful behaviour and very serious, serious concern needs to be addressed. I agree. What I don't agree is that there needs to be kind of a punitive element to that, that punishment element, which is what the criminal justice delivers, which a welfare-based system doesn't, that retribution. Um, I don't think that's appropriate that we treat children in, in that way. I don't think that's a useful thing in relation to, to children and young people. But there is a job to do in ensuring that... Um, that we all feel safe and children and young people are much more likely to be victims of crime and victims of harm than they are to harm others. And children are often likely to be victims of, victims of harmful behaviour by, by other children. So we need, as a, a most important concern, to make sure that, that children feel, feel safe um, and that adults feel safe and that we feel confident that we've got a system that will address that, that behaviour. But the kind of punishment element of it, um, I've got some concern with. And in, um, in human rights terms, when we talk about the right to an effective remedy, um, which the Lord Advocate spoke to, spoke to um, uh, in his opening, and which I spoke to when I, when I um, gave evidence to the committee um, last, that's a very important human rights principle that applies to, to, to children who are victims as well. And that means that we need to have very clear powers to ensure that, that, um, that harm is prop and, and rights breaches um, are properly investigated and that victims get the support and the care and the treatments that they, that they need. And we need to invest much more heavily in, in, in those things. Um, that uh, non-repetition is guaranteed, that's fundamentally important, that we put in place the things that ensure non-repetition. So, so it's those things, I suppose, that we need to, um, need to speak about. 
um, and focus on. In relation to the, la the last point of, of, of your question, in terms of um, the views of the, the views of people in Scotland as opposed to the views of, of, of the international community, I want to be very clear that, that we're part of the international community. We were involved in the development of these standards. Um, we have some world-leading um, academics. We have some very powerful um, civil society organisations that have been directly involved in not only the formulation of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, but engaged with the general comments. This isn't something foreign to us. This is something that we're, we're part of, and proudly so. Um, and uh, the experts on the um, on the committee again, you'll be hearing hearing from from Anne, Anne, Anne Skelton um, give the authoritative um, view about how to interpret the convention, and that's based on their experience of looking at lots of different lots of different countries. And so that comparative experience is is useful. But I would strongly refute an idea that um, that this is something being imposed upon us. This is something that that, that we've been actively engaged in. Um, but there is sometimes a tension between, between human rights principles, which are inherently not populist. The, the point of having a human rights system, and particularly the point of having a human rights system for children who don't have the same um, political power, they don't have the same economic power, and because of their age and stage of development are particularly vulnerable to, to rights abuses, the whole point of creating a system for them is, is that often it's not the popular thing, but it's the thing that we need to do as a society to ensure um, their proper development. Commissioner, I'd like to ask a little bit about um, child victims. I mean, you rightly point out that children are more likely to be victims of crime than, than, than perpetrators of that. Um, our hearing system obviously makes decisions based on the needs of the child that's referred to the, the child that's been perpetrating the harmful behaviour. And the only means that the reporter has of assuring victims that action's been taken is through the Victim Information Scheme. In your written evidence, you say that you don't think it's appropriate for this scheme to share even basic information with victims about what's, um, what action's been taken against the perpetrator. I suppose I would just want to ask for your reflections on how well we're representing child victims if, if, if we take that position and, and what is it you're proposing we do. And I suppose as a, as a second question, if we think about... Um, community safety and, and not thinking about punishment or retribution but we think about the safety of our communities and children and young people in it. Is it ever appropriate to um, securely accommodate someone who's been engaged in repeated harmful behaviour? I'm, I'm mindful of what the Solicitor General spoke about in terms of um, people committing um, or young people or children committing repeated sexual offences against other young children. I think I, care about all children deeply and would absolutely want to see prevention of, of these things happening, but we don't have a magic wand that we can wave and have a cut-off point. We need to deal with the reality of what of what children are going to experience. I'd just be interested to hear your reflections on those points. Yeah, I think they're both, they're both very important points. Um, in terms of um, in terms of the experience of, of child victims. Um, a, lot, a lot of work's been done around this, not, not in the least some of the work done on historic abuse um, and the, the human rights framework um, created by the, the Scottish Human Rights Commission um, around that, around looking, looking at the experience of, of, of being a, a victim, working with survivors um, and, um, and seeing what needs to be put in place. And it's, a, it's, a, it's a complex thing um, involving lots of, different, lots of different aspects, but very strongly focused on, on that non-repetition um, being understood. Um, and, and lots of the things that, that we need to do to support victims, particularly children's victims, um, uh, is listen to them, um, and when we do listen to them, um, it, it's very strongly about saying that they're not getting enough support at the moment. Um, we haven't got the, those support systems in place, those those guarantees that um, that they'll get what they what they need to move forward. Um, that they will have confidence that we're uh, addressing the behaviour. Um, so I think I think that that's that's quite important in, t in terms of the voice the voice of victims. Yeah. Just going to jump in. So yep. you you said that, that it's important for children to have confidence that we're addressing yep. the behaviour yep. that's been exacted on them. I suppose I would just want to push you to be a little bit more specific. Yep. I don't disagree with anything you're saying, but if we're not sharing information with them through our existing mm. um, victim information scheme, mm. how do we do that? How does you know a child who's been a victim yep. of a rape or a serious assault have confidence that the person who's yeah. committed this um, 
behaviour on and them. I think what, what's really important is that is that, that general information is available, saying saying this is this is how this will be approached, this is how we will ensure your safety, and the focus on 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 the the victim, um, and talking to them and saying these are the things that we'll we'll do to make sure that that you're safe. Um, a lot of a lot of that work's done out with the children's hearing system. In terms of sharing of information, though, your your other point, convener. Um, I do have some concerns, and again, the, um, it's addressed within the, the general comment from the UN um, as well, and addressed by the, by, by the Council of Europe, in terms of ensuring that the, um, a child who has contact with the criminal justice system isn't further stigmatised. And so strong, strong protections need to be put in place around kind of media reporting, um, and strong protections need to be put in place um, around ensuring... Um, that there won't be community-based reprisals, um, and so that information does need to be need to be kind of really restricted, um, because Forgive I think the me, consequences that, that, can that be. That does sound like that. That's all about yeah. the perpetrator of the of the harmful behaviour, and I care about them. I yeah. do, <laughs> but I'm asking you about about the the victims of that behaviour. Yeah. And I think that that in terms of what is useful um, for the victim. To, to know, and I think I think maybe more work needs to be done around that, around how how victims feel about knowing exactly what's happened to that person. Um, probably de depends on on the victim, but at a, a societal level, um, that balance between that person knowing exactly what happened, and as opposed to that person knowing that protections, actions have been taken, and protections have been put in place, the kind of general versus specific. Um, I think there's a careful balance to be struck there. And, and has, have you done any um, consultation with victims around that specific um, information that, that, that they would they would look for? So there was extensive. Sorry, um, there was extensive consultation done throughout the, the Scottish Human Rights Commission's work um, on um, uh, a framework in relation to, to historic, historic abuse. So there's been extensive work done both at the international level and through that through that work around the experiences was um, that of with victims. Adults? That was with adults who had been victims as children okay. um, of, of, um, of abuse. Um, there has been work done again by, by a number of the bodies that have that have um, submitted around working working with victims and again, again victims organizations can speak to that as well. I suppose that the, the, the balance that the, um, the Parliament needs to strike though is in terms of ensuring that um, that victims have the right to an effective remedy. And that does include assurances about what, what's happened and that there's been proper investigation and that action's been taken versus the, the right to respect for, for, for private family life um, and to be treated as a child of um, children who have conducted harmful behaviour. And, and there, 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 there is a balance to be struck there. And just my point around um, community safety and, and securely um, accommodating repeat perpetrators and that uh, impact on... Victims. Okay, could, could you possibly remind me of the I question? I don't know if I'll be able to remember my exact words. <laughs> um, I was just, I suppose we're, we're talking a lot about um, welfare and, and rehabilitation. I suppose I just, mm. uh, as you know, the Children's Commission and Children's Champion, I'm just asking, is there ever a case in your mind uh, to protect community safety, to, to, to deal with um, younger <laughs> people, to securely accommodate uh, just, them? Just uh, Oh, yes, there is. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, uh, I think that but the decision to secure a young person needs to be based on on their welfare. So if, if a young person um, if a young person is at risk of harm to themselves or others and no community based um, approach is, is going to work and we have some very, very good um, intensive support and monitoring kind of work. Um, but as an absolute last resort, then, yeah, there are there are some children um, where the only way of, of ensuring ensuring the safety of themselves and others is to put them into a welfare-based, supportive environment that is that is that is secure. But but that's absolutely key. Is that it has to be um, as we have within the children's hearing system, secure accommodation. So it's a, it's accommodation that that, that 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 is secure, but for the purpose of their welfare to ensure that 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 they aren't harming themselves or others. Not a criminal justice um, model. And I and I think that that without straying into other areas, um, real concerns about when we have children ending up in, the, in, in criminal justice in, in, in prisons um, and the discussions that are going on in other committees and, and, and in the parliament and more broadly around um, deep concerns about, about children ending up in parliament and, and, and the devastating consequences of, of, of youth suicide and, and, um, and, and harm 
um, of children ending up in a criminal justice setting, which is not appropriate, but a secure setting based on their welfare to ensure that they get the, the support and the treatment um, that they need um, absolutely is appropriate as a, as a, as a last resort. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, Mary Fee. Thank you, convener, and, and good morning. Um, Oh. Because I was asking, listening, I'm not doing very well at convening. Annie wanted to supplement you on that. Very small supplement. Sorry. Just, sorry. It, I know you're um, just with the, the convener speaking about witnesses there as well, our second ask for evidence in victim support centre, and they're saying that they believe 12 is the right balance. And I think that to bring the public along with us, and if we're look, really looking to be victim centred here as well, then do you think victim support are. Do you, do you, does there need to be more work done with the victims and what information and what are they going to get from it, really? I think that, that support for victims more generally and support for, for children victims um, is absolutely essential. We, we, this is something we, we're not getting right in Scotland um, more generally. Uh, I don't think it's necessarily linked exclusively to the age of criminal responsibility. I, 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 think, I think more, more generally those that, that, that suffer harm need more support, and we're not doing as well um, as we should on that, and so we need to put more resource into, into supporting victims. Um, and I think that there is uh, some more work to do in terms of uh, following up the, this understanding of the, the welfare-based approach being more effective and that actually the, the limits of the criminal justice system, and, um, and I think that, that, that victims, are, are, are certainly the ones I've spoken to and worked with, are, are very, very attuned um, to that, um, that, 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 that the, um, the punishment element of it, which the criminal justice um, provides, is often lower down the concern of, of, of most of the victims that I've spoken to than the, the idea of kind of ensuring non-repetition. But, but we certainly need more investment in, in victim, victim services. We certainly need to, to make sure that, that their voice is, is strongly, strongly heard in this. Um, but this is the same um, in all of the other countries as, as well. This, this, this is something that's well understood and, again, spoken to in the, um, in the international work that, that, that's been done. Um, and I think that the, the way forward is to ensure that, that that kind of information and work is done directly with victims and with, with Victim Support Scotland and other organisations that do such a great job supporting them. But, but it's about investing more in, in direct support for, for, for victims, um, ensuring that, that right to an effective remedy that they're guaranteed. Thank you. Lady. Thank you. Um, good morning again. Um, I wanted to ask you about c capacity, capacity and understanding and the use of psychological um, assessments. And you'll have heard the responses from the, the earlier panel to, to, to those questions. And last week when um, Malcolm Schaefer um, gave us evidence, I, I asked him the same question about the use of, of psychological assessments. And his answer to me was that the honest answer is that I do not believe that such assessments are done sufficiently at present and the approach can vary very much. What's your view of the use of psychological assessments and the benefits they can bring? And, and if psychological assessments were more routinely to done to determine capacity and understanding, one, would that alter the way young people are treated? And would it help strengthen the, the GERFEC and welfare-based approach that we have? Yeah. Um, our understanding of, 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 of child and adolescent development has, has been, been growing a lot over, over, over recent decades. And I think, and I think that, that's really important. We have a much better understanding than, than, than we did 10 years and, and certainly kind of 20 and 30 years ago. And so I think that the more that we can do to help understand a child and, and their developing capacity, um, the better. Um, and I think that one of the things that's come through very strongly um, in discussions that I've had with, with the children across Scotland, as, as you've heard me say before, I've got the, the best job in the world. I get to, to spend a great deal of time with, with children and young people across Scotland. And one of the things that consistently comes up, not in relation just to criminal justice, is um, that we're failing children in mental health terms that children aren't getting the, the mental health support that they need. And I think that flows through right through from very general right through to specific when we talk about um, acute mental illness and kind of calms, but also in relation to, to, to criminal justice, mm -hmm. is that we need to do much, much better in understanding what's happening with children and young people and providing that support at an earlier stage and build, building up that understanding. And I think these type of specific assessments that you're talking about, <laughs> forgive me, um, uh, are very useful and, and underutilised, but I think they, they're part of possibly a, a broader package that, that when we're making decisions um, about how to support a child, and young, a child or a young person who's conducted harmful behaviour, we need all of the, all of the evidence um, that's available um, and more focus should be made um, 
on looking at, at the development, the link to, to, to ACEs that you spoke about, about earlier, understanding that the child holistically, and that's what the, the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child talks so strongly about right back at the start um, in the preamble, um, this idea of growing up in an environment of happiness, love, and understanding. That understanding bit is really important, is, is that when we make decisions around children, we need to do it from a premise that we actually understand them. And the failures of the state that lead up to children conducting harmful behaviour need to be set within, within that, that context. And so the more that we can do to provide um, those decision makers who are tasked with um, supporting a child to, to, um, to not undertake further harmful behaviour or, or, or addressing some of those really, really serious things, the better. So, I, But I think... It's probably not just the, those, those, those particular reports, but it must, should be part of a kind of broader suite of information that we need about understanding children and young people. But do you think in, in terms of young people and, and the criminal justice system, do you think a psychological assessment should be a, a compulsory thing, a compulsory assessment that's carried out to help to determine the approach that should be taken, or should it be discretion, discretionary and left to the prosecutors? Um, obviously, when, when, when the Lord Advocate answered this question, he was speaking about kind of um, mm. breaking and entering, I think, or, or, and saying, well, actually, you, you wouldn't need that. I, I think what, what, what I think is absolutely important is that we have um, all of the information necessary. My, my view is, obviously, we shouldn't be prosecuting these, these children. Criminal justice system isn't, isn't the right place for them. Um, but if we will continue to put children into the criminal justice system, then we absolutely need to have an understanding of them as children um, to support prosecutorial decisions. Um, I've got a huge deal of respect for the, the prosecution service that we have in Scotland. Um, I, I think that the, the evidence that, that, that you'd heard, and, um, and I met with the Lord Advocate and Solicitor General just, just, just before Christmas. Um, there's been a very recent inspection report um, from, from the, um, on, on prosecution of, of children. I, I, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want anything that I say to be seen as a, as a criticism of, um, of prosecutorial services, which I think are very good in Scotland. I just don't think we should be prosecuting putting children into that system, would a compulsory requirement to have uh, a psychological assessment help inform that decision? Um, I think it, it probably would, but I would cede kind of to the experience of, of, of Scottish prosecutors in terms of saying that, that actually they, they don't think that would work. Um, in, human, in human rights terms, um, the important thing is treating, treating children as children, and if having compulsory reports would help us do that better, then, then that makes sense to me. But I probably don't have enough knowledge about, mm. um, about the specifics of, kind of when they wouldn't use one um, at, at the moment and whether creating kind of additional burden of, of, of those types of reports may, may not be suitable. So I, I, I'm sorry I'm not really answering your question, but it, it's because I probably um, <coughs> lack the knowledge of, um, of the previous panel. That's fine. Thank you. Thank you. Fulton. Thanks. So that would be supplementary on that, um, on Mary Fee's point, and, and perhaps to elaborate on your previous answer. Um, it, obviously, psychological assessments uh, don't come without risks themselves. They're not unintrusive in nature. And while I agree with, with the thrust of Mary Fee's argument generally, I, 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 wouldn't, I, I wouldn't suspect that a universal approach uh, is the best way forward, because obviously these assessments could bring out <coughs> trauma. Would, would, you, would you agree with that? And they would need to be... Um, managed carefully. Uh, yes, they, but, and, and I think there'd be general agreement um, 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 on that. Um, you'd referenced earlier the, the Barnhouse approach, and I, and I think and I think that there's um, a lot that we are learning from that um, in terms of saying that that children uh, who are victims, um, but also those those who are offending, come into the um, into the criminal justice system are, as I've said, uh, results of, of multiple failures by the state to give them the right support. So by, by nature of that type of behaviour, something's gone, something's gone wrong. We have failed. Um, and so ensuring that in getting the information that we need to, to investigate properly um, for, the, for the sake of the victim and for the sake of ensuring non-repetition, um, but also in assessing how best to, um, to, to address that behaviour we do need to get that information. It needs to be done in a very, very kind of sensitive way, though. Um, and there are very, very skilled practitioners and things like, like the Barna House model, um, which addresses not just victims but also also offenders. Um, I, th I think is is um, something that's very useful when you're talking about it. Kind of, I suppose I just refer to my previous answer in terms of saying that the kind of universalism. Um, there, 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 there may be cases where um, where it's not appropriate, but I, I, I can't. I don't have the knowledge to kind of um, give a, a, an informed answer on that. Okay, um, Gil Ross. 
Thanks. Um, good morning and uh, thanks for your evidence so far. I just want to get on the record. Um, obviously, we're looking at 12. There's an amendment in to go to 12 right away and to raise it higher, whether that be 14 or 16, within a certain period of time. <laughs> we heard from Malcolm Schaefer last week that the best thing to do would be to raise it to 12 now, do the work and then raise it further later on. And um, in your evidence this morning, you have said that there is additional work needed in terms of resources, in terms of um, speaking to victims to know what they feel or what they um, want. Um, put in place, there needs to be better mental health provision, we need to work on a welfare based approach there needs to be more work in the community to ensure community safety and just the support systems that need to be put in place so would it not be uh, the, right and proper that we raise it to 12 at the moment, do all this work with a view to raising it higher All of this work should be done anyway even if we weren't having this discussion all, all of that work is, is, is more, more general work um, that, that needs done um, and my very clear view based on the international <coughs> evidence and the strong view of and consistent view of all of the international bodies who are experts in this is that anything below 14 is not acceptable um, and so the idea of this parliament passing a piece of law which sets a standard below the um, the international minimum and particularly the European minimum um, I think would be very concerning and I think the Council of Europe's commissioner was very clear in her letter to, to the, the committee on this. Um, so even with a commitment to, to, to raise it in, in future, my view is that there is enough time before um, introduction of this legislation to, to have that work done and that, we, that, that, that the Parliament could be confident, particularly around 14, the absolute minimum, that, that that could be set now and that the work would be done in time for the implementation. This will still take some time to get through Parliament, but that work needs to be, needs, is happening already, a lot of that broader work. Um, but I would be very concerned about this Parliament sending a statement that, that 12 is, is all that we can do in Scotland at the moment, because that's below um, the international standard. I think the, the amendments that are currently before the, the committee in terms of 16, I, th I think, do bear further consideration. So um, I, I wouldn't support uh, 12, 12 on implementation with a sunrise clause to 14. Um, I would support 14 on implementation with a sunrise clause to, to 16. So you would say that the evidence from the children's reporter and the Crown Prosecution Service and the Lord Advocate and the Solicitor General, the people that are actually dealing with these cases on the ground, they're wrong in what they say about going to 12 now and then raising it further? I'm not saying that, that, that they're wrong in terms of saying that the kind of work needs to be done in terms of the time frame. Um, but this, even if, even if the, the, this committee was to take a decision at stage two, there's still time be before stage three and an implementation date that was set um, at some stage in the future, I, th I think that allows sufficient time. Um, I suppose where, where I possibly kind of um, take a different view, but, but with, with great respect to, to Malcolm Schaefer in terms of the best way to immediately um, address the, the up to 12 that we put that in now to secure, um, secure that and then bring that in. I think that there's, there's enough time um, before implementation. Um, and I'd be, I'd be very concerned about, about setting 12 now even with even with a delayed um, implementation of, of, of 14, um, because I think that that, that um, sends the the wrong message. Um, I think that that it um, the international community has been very clear. The, the rights principles are very clear. The reasons for changing are very clear. If what we're talking about is needing to put in place some some practice things, um, then we just need to we need to get on with that. Um, what I would want to be really clear about, though, is that the intention of doing that additional work is to make sure that, that this change works in practice. It's not to inform a decision about whether to change. And so I think that we can put in the resources to make sure that, 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 that all of those broader things are done. Um, and particularly at, at 14, we're, we're talking about very small numbers, some very serious, serious um, and concerning harmful behaviour, but, but, but quite small numbers at, at, at 14, more so at 16. And I think that the evidence has been consistent that, that the move to 14 is easier than the move to 16. Um, but it's my, it's my very firm view that, that, that 14 is the, international, is the European standard and will soon be the international standard. And if this parliament was to pass a piece of law which, which says that, um, that Scotland 
and its representatives think that 12 is the right age, albeit even the time limited. Um, I've got real concerns about because this isn't something new. This isn't some. This isn't. This isn't a new standard that's just been developed. This is something that's been around for a very long time. Um, this debate's been around a long, a, a long time. I was, was looking back at some of the the early debates that took place um, 20 years ago, and and this has been a debate that, that that's been live since the beginning of the Parliament and, and members of the Parliament in, in, in 2000 expressed concern that we were in breach of our human rights obligations then. This has been a consistent message. And, and, uh, and I'm, I'm hugely concerned that, that if the result of this is to come in below the minimum standard, even for a period um, of, of two years, that's not, that, that, that doesn't serve Scotland's children. Okay. Oliver, brief supplementary. Uh, th thank you, convener. I mean, I, you referenced the, the, the debate from 20 years ago. Is it not back, I mean, I asked you a similar question uh, when you were last year. I mean, is it not the case that you know, by, by pushing and, and pushing too too hard, you, you just end up not taking the issue forward at all. And you know, again, you know, we've we've heard uh, several times, even today, you know, how much work went in to get us to 12. You know, it, 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 is, is all that to be discounted in the hope of of, of getting to, to 14 or, or 16? You know, does it not represent an does it not represent an improvement? And do we not have to put, you know to, to put that up front as well? Um, it, it's not. It's not to reject the the, the important and hard work that, that that's been done. Um, it's to, to reflect the fact that, that that work equally applies to to a higher to a higher age. Um, and my job as children's commissioner is to promote and, and safeguard the rights of children and young people. Other people have have different roles. But I would be remiss in my role to recommend to this parliament that we take um, a view that's below the international standard. And and just bearing in mind, and, and I know that I'm at risk of repeating myself. Um, <coughs> that this isn't international minimum standard. This is the absolute minimum. We're not here just discussing kind of something incredibly progressive. Um, this is the absolute, absolute minimum that we're talking about is 14. Um, the, the, the case for it is, in my view, incredibly strong, both internationally and domestically. And um, yeah, uh, I appreciate that uh, that others who have different roles and 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 um, getting this passed is is important as well. But um, but my my role as children's commissioner is to 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 advise you um, on what the the human rights of children demands, and fourteen is the absolute minimum. Okay, thank you for your evidence this morning, um, Commissioner. The committee has already agreed to consider the evidence in private, so we'll move into private session and ask the public gallery to clear. After consideration of evidence, the committee will reconvene not before 1.15 p.m. in committee room one, but it will take evidence via video conference from Professor Anne Skelton of the UN <coughs> Committee on the Rights of the Child. We'll now move into private session. <coughs>